Good evening. I am so happy that you're with me this evening. Our Bible study will be out of 1 John chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. And if you're with me this evening, could you let me know by commenting in the comments section? Just say hello. And uh, if you want to share something that the Lord is doing in your life, that would be great. But tonight, <clears throat> we're going to be in 1 John 3. It'll be, we will be starting at verse 11 and going through uh, the rest of the chapter to verse 24. And the title of our lesson tonight is Confident Love. So before we begin, let's open up in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for gathering us together this, e <coughs> this evening. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, for your anointing to be upon this lesson, that your Holy Spirit will illuminate the truths that you have written in your word and to lay these things in our heart concerning loving one another. And Lord, we want to see what you have to say this evening, not what man has to say, but what, what God has to say. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> <clears throat> so what I would like to bring out is that the epistles of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John were written about the same time as the Gospel of John, and it was written about 80 to 95 AD. John is writing these personal letters to his flock, and I want to spend um, a little bit of time teaching some Bible history before we begin this lesson. John wrote um, his epistles, the first, second, and third John, during a time when false concepts of Jesus um, and of the gospel and of spirituality had threatened to completely redefine Christianity. And it had um, gotten so bad, it got to the point of actually destroying the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So this crisis occurred in the first century church. It's interesting to note that in 1 John, that John offers nothing new and improved when writing this letter to the church. His calling to write these epistles was to call the church back to what is original, to which was from the beginning, that living in this last hour, that we might strengthen the things which remain, that we might remain in him that is true, even in his son Jesus Christ, the true God, life. So 1 John was written to counter a specific distortion of Christianity, which was called Gnosticism. Now, if you're taking notes, Gnosticism is spelt G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. So what is Gnosticism? Well, Gnosticism is a Greek term, which means a special kind of of elite knowledge. A Gnostic was known as a knowing one. So Gnostics had infiltrated the early church. So what did these Gnostics claim to know? Well, what they claimed to know was to have an elite knowledge of God. They claimed to know God in a more superior way than the average Christian, which set them up on a higher level than the average Christian. They felt the gospel, the, <clears throat> they felt the gospel and the apostles were preaching and teaching. Well, what they were teaching and preaching was too simple. It was too primitive. It was good enough for the uneducated people, people who were just farmers or just housewives or just servants. These simple, so-called uneducated people made up the bulk of the Christian church in the first century. The Gnostics, they would enter a church 
And what would they do? Is they would intimidate the so-called simple Christians. And they would ask him this question, do you really know God? You know, they would say, well, we have an elite knowledge of who God is, and we have an anointing that you don't have. This would unsettle the faith of the ordinary Christian. After all, who wants to just be ordinary when you can be a member of the elite and become a part of the upper level or inner circle of the knowing ones. So these Gnostics would prophesy and speak about their esoteric visions and revelations, their communication with, with angels, and they would boast of their knowledge or their secret doctrines. The average Christian's assurance in their salvation would begin to unravel because they, they would think to themselves, well, you know, my, uh, my relationship with God is not like theirs. You know, they're on an upper level. So who am I? So you see, the average ordinary Christian like you and me, our faith consisted of what? Following the teachings of Jesus, isn't it? And we follow the teachings and Holy Scripture. So we meet together in church as the body of Christ, and we pray, and we worship God, we study scripture, we hear the word of God, and we also encourage and build each other up in the faith. And we also do this. We also wait patiently for the coming of our Lord and Savior. And we also endure persecution and ridicule and scorn from this world. But the Gnostics, they would look down on all these things with disdain. They insisted that the church strive to be more spiritual by going beyond that which is written. As a result, sadly, many Christians in the church, in the first century church, were drawn away. So we see that there was a great falling away in the early first century church. They were drawn away into a counterfeit Christianity. So this is why John was led of God to write this letter to bring the church back to basics. Today we have the same Gnostics that are in the church today in these last days because, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. So we have these super duper spiritual people who call themselves ministers or prophets or even apostles, have come into the church speaking the exact same false teachings. They are attempting to do what? To redefine Christianity. They want to make it by going beyond that which is written. This is why when someone comes along and they claim that they are a great minister or a prophet or whatever title they want to plug onto their name, we've got to be careful. We have to test the spirits. Don't just eat everything that they teach. Don't just accept it as truth until you line up what they are saying to the Word of God. So let us start in our lesson today. The title of this teaching is Confident Love. So let's begin at 1 John chapter 3. Let's start at verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, who murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, <clears throat> if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in tongue, 
and let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. By this we know that we are of the truth. We shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, well, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> and love one another as he gave us command. Commandment. <clears throat> now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. You know, all of us that one time in our lives have had trouble loving someone whom we deem unlovable. You know, this is an issue everyone has had to deal with. Maybe you're dealing with this issue right now. Yet in the word of God, we see that there's a command given to us as believers to love one another. You know, starting in verse 11, John writes, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So where did this message come from? Well, it comes from the beginning. We find this in the teachings of Jesus, and we can find this in John 13, verses 34 and 35. So remember, 1 John, this epistle, was written to bring the church back to basics, back to the beginning, and back to the gospel, the basic teachings, the simple um, message of the gospel. And this is very basic, yet powerful, that we should love one another. You know, it's a very simple thing to say, don't you, don't you agree? When we say, well, let's just love one another. We do it with a cheerful heart, don't we? But once we get out into the real world, we find that it's a very difficult almost impossible to do. You know, loving one another is not something that is automatic in our lives. You know, we're not programmed like, <clears throat> like a robot, you know, programmed to love and programmed to obey God and to obey his commandments. You know, we just, <clears throat> you know, we, we don't just go out there and love, love, love. You know, this is why John says that we should love one another. Yes, we should, but do we always do that? No, we don't always do that, but we should. You know, it is God's will that we love one another, yet he will not interfere with our own will. How many of you have discovered that? You know, God does not interfere with our own will. We have the freedom to choose to love or not to love, to obey God, or not to obey God. You know, God could use his power to force us to obey him, but he chooses not to work this way. He gives us his word. He gives us his commands, yet he never forces himself upon us. We as Christians, did you know that we can resist the Holy Spirit? We can even grieve the Holy Spirit. If someone comes up to you and is unkind to you, you know what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do because we have his word and we are to give it to God. You know, just give that strife to God. If somebody's unkind to you, just give it to him. Pray about it and forgive. But is this something that we always do? Well, not always. Sometimes we choose to nurse a grudge or we act unkindly back at this person as kind of like a revenge. Well, I'm just going to treat you the way you treat me. And uh, we resist the Holy Spirit. And when we resist the Holy Spirit, then we're going to find ourselves to be miserable as born-again Christians. Let's look at verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, had murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. 
you know, John really goes back to the beginning here, doesn't he? He goes way back to Genesis 4. You know, John brings out this issue of, of loving or not loving. He brings out the example of Cain. Cain, as you know, hated his brother so much that he killed him. Why did Cain hate his brother so much? Well, it was because Abel was a righteous man. And he is a man that walked with God and pleased God. You know, Cain hated anything that was good or of God. We find that in the world today. We have people that hate those that are standing for righteousness. We, we see that in the world uh, so much in these last days where people are not even hiding it anymore. I mean, they are out there just hating anyone that stands on God's word, that stands for righteousness, that stands for truth, that stands for life. You know, this is why he brings out Cain as an example. You know, John giving uh, this example of Cain is a very strong message. You might say, well, you know, why is he doing this? Isn't this just a choice to love or not to love someone? Um, we're not really talking about killing somebody. Well, John points out that if we allow ill will in our heart towards a brother, then we have started down a very dangerous road. And that road will ultimately lead to murder. It might not be a literal murder, but a spiritual murder. You know, look at Matthew 5. Verses 21 through 22, it says, You have heard it said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, which means a, uh, you know, talking about contempt, you, you have contempt towards your brother. That's Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. So Jesus is warning us. If you are on this dangerous path, it will ultimately lead to hellfire. He is talking about uh, here, here's what he's talking about. He's talking about a heart condition that is tantamount to murder. It's possible to commit murder in your heart and in your heart that is equal to actually committing murder. So sin, as you know, begins in the heart. Love also begins in the heart. You know, whatever is in your heart, it is going to come out in your life, literally. In verse 13, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. You know, we shouldn't be shocked or surprised it hates you. You know, we, we have, a, you know, the world does have a hatred to us. We, we can see it in these last days, but we're not to be shocked by it. You know, Cain is a picture of the world and the world is hostile to God. The world seeks its own way and rejects God. The world wants to do things that want to make up their own decisions. You know, when we look at Cain, Cain did this. What did Cain do? He sought his own way and he rejected God. He sought the works of his own hand. He wanted to bring a sacrifice of his own works before God and uh, the sweat of his brow as a, as a sacrifice to God. Anything, anything but a broken, bloody lamb. The world seeks its own works, it, its own efforts, and rejects God's sacrifice. It rejects Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who was sacrificed to take the sin uh, to forgive the sin of the world. As Cain hated Abel, 
we will find in these last days, oh, well, ever since, that the world hates you. You see, the world hates Christians because it hates Christ. Whoever hates is in darkness, as Cain and the world. The world is full of Cain's, who hates the church, hates anything that is godly and righteous. And these Cain's, what do they want to do? Well, they want to get rid of you. They want to get rid of the church. They want to get rid of God. You know, we got to keep in mind that we're God's witnesses in this world of God's love. So we've got to share the love of God in this world. God wants us to love each other and to forgive one another. And this world will see very clearly that we do belong to Jesus Christ. And this gives glory to God. Look at Luke 6. <clears throat> excuse me, in Luke 6, 27 through 28, says, But I tell you, who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. So we notice, we need to notice those four things that we're to do, to love, do good, bless, and pray. And we do these things when the canes of this world are doing the exact opposite to you. You know, they are our enemies. Yet we are to love. We're to do good, bless, and pray for them. It's a choice that we have to make. Either we do this or we do our own thing. You know, verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So John has taken this issue of love and he brings forth these two lives. He says, Every single one of us can choose to walk down one of these roads, the road of Cain or the road of Christ. We have the Cain, and we have the example given to us by Jesus. Cain took a life. Jesus, however, laid down his life. Do you see the difference? You know, we are to exemplify the latter. We are to lay down our lives for our brothers. You know, those Gnostics that came into the early church in the first century church, they spiritualized love, thus allowing a, for a professing Christian to claim that they love God at a higher level than the ordinary Christian. And what was so terrible about this was at the same time they had contempt and hate for other Christians. So what does it mean to love God? Well, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So what does that mean to love man? <clears throat> what does it mean to love man? Is to lay down our lives for the brethren. It is that willingness to set aside our own interests, preferences, and pride and be willing to serve the interests of our Christian brothers to stick with them and to allow them to stick with us. Only by this practice can we truly receive the love of God. Verse 17, <clears throat> but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. <clears throat> so don't just be hearers of the word, but we must be doers of the word. Any claim for loving God should result in 
observable deeds of compassion for others. So let us not just love in word or tongue, which means don't just say that you love your brothers and then go off. And you know, if you see a brother in need and you say, oh, brother, I love you, but you know, good luck with all that. Goodbye. And off you go. You know, that's loving only in word or in tongue. But what we need to do is we need to let the love of God manifest itself in our lives through deeds and in truth. So we reach out and we help our brother that is in need. So we need to let our love be authentic. And by this, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before God. It says in verse 20 that if our heart condemns us, how many of you ever had that happen? where your heart condemns you. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Isn't that great to know? You know, when our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows all things. Wow. You know, if your heart condemns you, it may very well be the conviction of the Holy Spirit taking place in your life. You know, the Holy Spirit does not condemn you. That's one thing that I want to make clear is that the Holy Spirit will never condemn a Christian. What, a, what the Holy Spirit does, his ministry in your life is to convict you. He convicts you of sin that you have not yet rooted out of your life. You know, John encourages us by showing us that God is greater than our heart. And that is really a comfort because our hearts can be very mis misleading. Our hearts can speak to us and deceive us. So we need to know that God is greater than that. The Holy Spirit will never deceive us. You know, when he convicts us, he will never, ever deceive us. You know, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and he speaks. And whatever he speaks, it will never deceive us. He will always lead us to Jesus Christ, the love of God. God sees not only what our heart tells us, but he also knows everything about us in minute detail. He knows us better than we know ourselves. His great love will never condemn us because we are in Christ. And verse 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And that is so true. If our hearts are not condemning us, this shows us that we do not resist loving others, helping those who are in need. We therefore have this blessed assurance, or we have this confidence in our relationship with God. And that is such a blessed place to be. We, it means that we have tamed the heart of stony selfishness and have allowed our hearts to be soft and pliable in the hand of our master, who is our potter. He is the potter and we are the clay. And, you know, and, it, and we need to have our hearts soft in his hand. And when we love others and we show kindness, we reveal to the world that we have a new heart. We are born again Christians. We have a heart that's recreated by God's grace. In verse 22, and whatever we ask, <clears throat> we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So you see, with a heart of obedience and walking pleasing in God's sight, we therefore can ask anything of God. And whatever we ask, whatever desire we have and we ask, that desire lines up with God's will. You know, we won't be asking God for things out of selfish reasons or selfish desires. You know, in verse 23, it says, and this is his commandment. And what is his commandment? Number one, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Number 
two, we need to love one another as he gave us commandment. So this commandment that John is stating here did not come it came from God. This, this commandment is to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, that name that is above all names, and to love one another. You see, this commandment cannot be broken up or split up or disconnected from each other unless we are born again Christians, believing on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. It would be totally impossible for us to love one another. To obey this commandment <clears throat> shows us that we have a heart that uh, pleases God, a, a clean heart, a heart that uh, loves God and loves others. So this is the act of surrender, really. You know, we need to surrender everything. We need to surrender our whole will to God. And this is that act of surrender, putting your whole trust in Jesus with a heart that is always willing to follow his teachings. In verse 24, now he who keep, keeps this commandment abides in him. You know, last week I talked about abiding in the vine. You know, if you keep his commandments, you are abiding in the vine and he abides in you. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. We know we are in fellowship with God and we keep his commandments. We will see with evidence of our obedience when our lives show that we are loving one another faithfully. The spirit abides in us. And he changes our hearts, you know, and he keeps um, so that we can keep the commands from pure motives, not just out of fear of punishment, but that we because we love him and we have pure motives. You know, a loving church that serves the needy in his community it gives a powerful witness to the spirit of God in its midst. You know, we please the Father when we follow the teachings of His Son <clears throat> and allow His Spirit to love for others. So John asks this question. Now I'm going to conclude. John asks if we love God. He insisted that we cannot make a credible claim to loving God if we hate people. Furthermore, we cannot claim to love people without evidence. You know, does the love of God in our hearts result in acts of kindness to others, helping a brother or sister in need? You know, Cain's heart of hate and anger resulted in murder, a heinous but accurate reflection of his inner thoughts. His inner thoughts were dark. His heart was in darkness. He was, you know, his heart was void of God's presence. You know, Jesus Christ's heart of love resulted in the willingness to sacrifice his life as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. This is the same world that John warned all of us that will hate Jesus. And this world will also hate us because we are his followers. The paradox is profound. Evidence is there with Jesus. While we were his enemies, Jesus Christ died for us. You know, that is, while we were yet still sinners, he died for us. So I hope and pray that this message tonight built you up in your faith and blessed you. And I want to end in prayer. Loving Father, Loving <clears throat> Heavenly Father, help us to always love others as you loved us. Help us to remember that when the world hates us, comfort us with your love. Give us the presence of the, your Holy Spirit in new hearts to love one another and that our love will show in our actions. And we ask this 
tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm going to say good night to all of you, and I hope and pray that you are blessed. And please let me know that you are with me this evening if you can. You can even private message me. And I am so happy that, um, that I was with you this evening. And I pray that the love and the peace of God be in your hearts this evening. Amen.